Welcome to the Lyceum Chamber Music Series, presented by the Washington Metropolitan Philharmonic Association. From me, Caroline Musset, Executive Director of the Association. In a moment, Artistic Director Yule James, together with many of you watching and listening at home, will welcome our featured artists. First and briefly, let me tell you about the Association. In addition to this series, our nonprofit organization is comprised of three orchestras, Washington Metropolitan Philharmonic, Washington Metropolitan Youth Orchestra, and for our youngest musicians in middle school, Washington Metropolitan Concert Orchestra. To learn more about us, visit wmpamusic.org. We appreciate the opportunity to present these free online recitals to you all of which are available on demand on YouTube. Just search WMPA. That said, none of our activities would be possible without your support. If you are able to make a donation, we'd be most grateful. Visit us online at wmpamusic.org slash donate, or simply click on show more in the description below this video for the direct link to make a contribution and to learn more about the artist. Thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the performance. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the 38th concert of uh, this series. Started back in July of 2020. And uh, we're glad to be with you again. Uh, today we have members of the Charm City Baroque, and uh, I'm sure you're going to be fascinated by not only the playing and how people manage these wonderful instruments and the music. I thought uh, it might be a good idea to talk a little bit about uh, the music. Let's start with uh, the wonderful violinist, uh, Michael DiCepio. Michael, uh, I know you're uh, uh, playing a, an authentic Baroque violin, and it's got gut strings, and the tensions on those strings are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how about telling us a little more about that instrument? Well, this is a modern replica of a Baroque violin, and uh, You'll notice there's no chin rest because that came in later. And um, the neck is a little shorter and uh, the, also the fingerboard. Um, so there, there are minor differences, but um, also in the interior uh, construction, the sound post and so forth. And, and as you mentioned, it has uh, strings made of sheep gut, which they were until the 20th century. And even well into the 20th century, actually, they were used. Uh, but actually, the uh, the lowest string, the G string, has a metal winding on it, so it's a metal on gut. Really? Is that, is that a bona fide Baroque? Yeah, that came in at a certain point. At first, they were, it, all the strings were just plain gut, but then mm. that's a little hard to manage on the low string, so they added metal to it, usually silver. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like a, a slightly smaller instrument than the modern violin. Yeah, well, the, the sizes weren't so standardized to begin with. This is actually modeled on an Amati. Um, violin. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and how do you find playing that instrument uh, as opposed to a modern instrument? Well, they, ha they have different challenges, but um, I've, I like the unique uh, expressive qualities of the Baroque violin. It's what I personally prefer, but I like both. Huh. Well, my uh, view is that when you play that, it's pretty wonderful. Oh, thanks. And, and sir, what are, what's all this stuff out here? You're playing a, a ukulele, is that? This is the Baroque banjo. Uh, so this is an English cittern. Um, this would have been mostly in Renaissance consorts um, alongside lute and gamba and recorders. Uh, it's a wire strung instrument um, in courses. So each string is in twos. And then I have one that's in three. Because why not have one more string to tune? Is that just to increase the power of the sound? Uh, no, I'm not quite sure. It doesn't really add that much 
extra volume, but when I had this instrument built, I had been studying on my teacher's instrument, and that's how his was strung, and it's just how I got accustomed to it, so I had it made that way. And, um, who, yeah. who did that wonderful flower in the middle of it? That's amazing. So the instrument's made by Ugo Casalonga. He builds in Corsica. Uh -huh. And um, I, I got to know him by accident. I stumbled across a mandolin ad on Facebook that I thought was an interesting thing. So I dug into him a little bit and found that he built citterns. So I called him up and I had him build me this one. He sent me pictures the whole process. So it started from a tree stump and ended up this. Wonderful, yep. wonderful. So, What's that hook on the back? So they made these with little hooks here so that you know these would be hanging up in the barber shop and while you're waiting your turn to have your hair cut, you could pull an instrument down and improvise with other players or play the solos of the day and you know, have, <laughs> have fun, I suppose. Can you, can you strum it a little bit, you know, just for fun? Sure, and I play this with a modern pick, although at the time it would have been played with a quill or some kind of other plectrum, but. Sounds just like a ukulele. <laughs> yeah. Much nicer tone, though. Yeah. yeah. And how about the other two on the floor? I don't know whether that you can see it, uh, uh, folks, uh, but you, you can see that they're big and really complicated. How many strings are in that? So this is a 13-course Baroque lute. This mm -hmm. would have been the largest size of lute before you get to a, the, the, the more bassy theorbos. Um, but this was used as a continuo instrument a little bit in Germany, um, but mostly it's a solo instrument. Um, and the music written for this by Weiss and Bach, and uh, it's just absolutely wonderful music. Um, typically, these are completely double strung, so there would be 30 strings on there. Um, but I've taken most of the courses off and I have it single. So the single stringing just gives me more room with my finger. I'm going between modern guitar and lute a lot. So I try to keep the spacing. The how, how is the music written for these? Uh, I mean, it must be very different from what we normally see. Uh, yeah, the continuo scores I just read from a bass line. So it's kind of like figured bass. I read from figured bass yeah. when I'm playing continuo, but the solos are written in this tablature system. Isn't that? Hey, everybody. Can, I don't know if you can see this or not. So but. this is French lute tablature. It works a lot like modern day rock and roll guitar tablature. Um, although in guitar tablature, we use number systems. So each line represents a string. And then we put the number of the fret you should play would be printed on the line that represents that string. I don't know how in the world you do this. So this these are all in the letters. Um, so A for open string, B for first fret, C for second fret. Unbelievable. And this is, incidentally, everybody, this is uh, the Bach Fugue BWV 1000. So, and how about the other very large instrument? All right, so this is half lute and half giraffe. This is the Fiorbo. It maintains the same body as all the other lutes do. Um, the neck is pretty much the same, it's just bigger. And then it has a neck extension. And this is required to have our bass strings at the pitches that they're at. Uh, and Alessandro Piccinini, who is a, um, an arch lute player, is, this is sort of his invention of getting our bass. So this is, uh, this is like a, a jazz bass. Almost. This is a jazz bass with a modern six string guitar attached. On top, yeah. So, so we have a scale. Although I'm, in, I'm tuned in A, so <laughs> I have it tuned, custom tuned here. Um, so we have that scale and then plus a guitar. Now. How about that? All you guitar players out there lust for this instrument. Yeah. That's what I did, and then I learned that the tuning is a little bit backwards to what we're used to. On these two instruments, the tuning goes from low to high, and this goes from low to high to low again. So it's... So my highest pitch string is my third string in. 
Well, you have a very strange brain to, to, put, to, to, to be able to accommodate all this. I, I, my hat's off. <laughs> and and I have a, I'm a great admirer. Incidentally, they sound wonderful. So without any further ado, we now have our members of the Charm City Baroque.
Our next composer is a, uh, on the obscure side, Ignazio Albertini. Uh, was apparently from northern Italy, probably Milan, but uh, spent his career in German-speaking countries, uh, notably Austria. And um, you, as you can hear in the music, he uh, sort of combines the best of both worlds, uh, Italian brilliance and virtuosity with German uh, contrapuntal know-how. I hope you enjoy it.
We are next going to play some selections from Bach's famous six solos for violin. First, I'm going to play from the original violin version, and then John is going to play one of the fugues arranged for lute.
So I'm going to be playing the fugue from BWV 1000, um, arranged obviously for 13 course Baroque lute and many other instruments. So here we go.
Our last composer is Silvius Leopold Weiss, who was a lutenist and a friend and colleague of Bach. And uh, to me, his music is uh, the most Bach-like of any composer, uh, including maybe even Bach's own children. Uh, see if you agree.
Thanks again for tuning in and for your support. 
If you're able to donate to help fund this series and support magnificent musicians, please visit wmpamusic.org slash donate. We wish you a fond farewell from the Lyceum in Alexandria, from all of us at Washington Metropolitan Philharmonic Association, and look forward to being with you again soon.